Well, I was certainly uh, intrigued by the four speakers. Thank you so much for um, speaking and giving us uh, thought-provoking ideas. Um, I have a few questions, but I'm going to start with um, most of you are basically saying that um, there's a lot that we don't understand yet, but we've seen, it seems to be that this, the increase in the prevalence of obesity really is about an increase in food intake. And I would like perhaps each of you to comment on um, the alternative theories because somehow we, we just can't stomach the idea that it, it's because of an increase in food intake and several um, colleagues of ours have thought up um, uh, the idea of sleep deprivation, especially in children, so that children are sleeping less um, over the years, and what does that have a relevance? Does, does that is that a plausible theory? Um, and the idea of stress, perhaps that it's causing more stress, and the idea of stress and cortisol. There's also another theory about air conditioning and thermogenesis. A decrease in smoking causing the rise in obesity. And then another idea is endocrine disrupting chemicals in the food supply, EDCs. <coughs> Fidgeting or meat and um, energy balance. And of course, um, some of you have also mentioned symbiotics, pre and probiotics, and a, a, a viral cause for obesity. So um, that's really six questions in one, but perhaps uh, you can comment on what you feel is most interesting. Okay. Well, start down that end. I was worried you might say that. <laughs> well, you can pass if you'd like. <laughs> so I guess my, my take on this is that any of these things have to work either through food intake or energy expenditure. There's no other way that they can mysteriously work have an effect on your body weight. So uh, ev everything has to work through that energy balance model, whatever it is. And all the data that I presented really say that nothing is happening on the energy expenditure side of the equation. So if your interpretation is that any of these mechanisms, whatever they be, are acting through an effect on energy expenditure, the evidence is just not there that that's, that's the case. If you're making an inference that they somehow affect our food intake, then I think that's a possibility and that's something that's maybe to be considered. And that's where I would respond. Let me ask you to comment on a, a paper that Andrew Prentice and Jeff wrote. Gluttony and Slow. Right. Which I think they argued that it was mainly the activity side. Where was the flaw in that paper? So the flaw in that paper is there are no measurements of energy expenditure. So it's completely based on behavioral observation. And as I showed, behavior has changed. So it's very clear that behavior has changed between the 1950s and now. But the question is, has that behavioral change had any impact on our energy expenditure? And I don't think there's any evidence to support that. Their interpretation was if there were more cars around, Therefore, our energy expenditure must have gone down. Okay, and I, I uh, have long been concerned by that paper because it doesn't fit anything I learned either. Why don't you write a new paper called a slug, a Sloth and Gluttony Revisited? <laughs> Publish it in BMJ. I think Mike, <laughs> Mike Stock already wrote that paper, I think, Gluttony and Sloth Revisited. Oh, uh, well, but, can't uh, it Revisited <laughs> twice. I can't, can't revisit it twice. But uh, the, the stuff I just presented is actually in the International Journal of Obesity just two months ago. So. Okay, George, do you want to? And whoever has another question, come up here. So we'll be ready. Um, and I think all of these factors can influence the regulatory system, which I tried to argue I believe exists. Um, and they all have modest effects, and I think I would take them as in acting on that heritability sense that uh, Steve talked about earlier, that if you are at risk, then the sleep deprivation or excess may make a difference. And, uh, I, and, and one of the studies on sleep, for example, from Japan, where there isn't much obesity relative to what we think of it as, uh, 
uh, clearly demonstrates that those children who had less sleep were fatter or heavier as they went into school. So it operates across cultures where there's fatness or no fatness, that weight levels change a little. We just came back from Japan's obesity meeting uh, last week. Um, and one of the comments that someone made that, to me that I thought was very incisive, they said, you know, many Americans who come to Japan um, come in on the small portion sizes uh, of Japanese food. Uh, and I said, isn't that interesting? That portion sizes, I mean, you know, if you go to a restaurant in the United States, you get humongous plates and food on them. Uh, and uh, this, this restaurant person in Japan saying that Americans can comment on how little the portion sizes are says something in exactly what you're saying, that it's a food intake issue, and that we're, we're able to make those large food portion sizes in part because our government subsidizes a lot of cheap food. And, and clearly, one of the other issues that we all ought to get behind is getting the food subsidies out from uh, things like uh, corn and sugar uh, and rice, all of the high carbohydrate, high fat things, um, and, and make it a level playing field. And that would really change the makeup of the food supply we have. Oil price will also make, I think, an even bigger difference. So I guess I'm confused by your analysis, because I, I guess I think it's a little too simple, because you're just treating the body, as, in essence, as a black box. So all your data was expressed per person. And as I understand it, when there's a positive energy balance, you gain lean mass and fat mass, and you sort of settle at a higher uh, weight, which is associated with more fat mass, with a higher resting energy. So that when you're just comparing it, I'm not sure it's as simple. You know, the, so you can be obese and have a high energy expenditure because you have essentially passive exercise because you're carrying around fat. And then that reaches an equilibrium. Whereas if I am a, a construction worker, I might reach that with a different body composition. And perhaps a interaction between exercise and food intake so it's more tightly tuned, in theory, if it works well. So I, I don't think you can talk about food intake and energy expenditure when, in fact, we know they interact. Yeah, exercise and food intake interact, so it's not that simple. <laughs> I kind of, you, you I, can't have uh, <laughs> something here. I kind of back John, and I think it sort of is. You know, I mean, that we maybe unnecessarily complicate uh, it. And, and I, I think that my answer to the original questions were that, that exactly that of John. Or any putative factor, be it a virus, be it a sleep pattern, etc., has to impact on one or other side of the of the equation, or else it's happening through a metaphysical rather than a physical. Uh, process and, and you know, happen to think obesity is a physical and biological process, so it has to I impact. Of course, energy expenditure and, and energy intake interact, but if you're going to change your fat mass, one has to exceed the other, or, or well, there has to be a progressive you know, to, to, to put it down as, 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 as fat mass. Uh, and so, so, you know, to add to your list of interesting, I mean, one interesting e potential etiological factor that nobody's has touched on today is, is, the, is the socioeconomic class issue with obesity. Which, which is actually something that's actually quite hard, quite tough to explain. Why are poor people fat, fatter than rich people? And, and that's you know, a, a very profound effect in most societies, and it's changed from previous centuries where, where the only fat people were rich people. Uh, and, and we haven't actually addressed that question very much today. And, I, I, and to me, some of the more interesting debates to have with people who have a, a more sociological, less biological approach to adiposity is to try and grapple with that with that idea, it's going to be quite uncomfortable sometimes to try to work out why that might be. But I think it's a very important question to ask the why, why, is, why, is, why is poverty and low socioeconomic class and low education so profoundly affected, <coughs> associated with adiposity. Uh, Can I comment on that? Yeah. Before, before you ask, but, um, as I said in part of my talk, I was talking about cost when I ignored it. Um, but if you look at the cost of food, your calorie return per dollar is much higher with high fat, high carbohydrate food mix. Brunowski's very nice analysis of these. Uh, 
if you want to eat the high quality foods in the food supply, it costs you a lot of money. Uh, and the people who don't have a lot of money, you can get a very um, tasty diet from McDonald's for very little money. And I suspect that a, a big component of the uh, socioeconomic difference is, a, is simply an economic difference. If they had money, uh, they wouldn't have it. And, and people who live in, in uh, higher uh, income uh, postal codes in our country are less fat. It's clearly a function of income. And if we could raise the income level of everybody, we would probably reduce the obesity level because they could afford to buy things that were not so calorie dense. And that's Brave's, Brave's perspective on it. Uh, a terrific, uh, four terrific talks, a really great uh, symposium. And to, to echo uh, Stephen, thermodynamics, it's the law. You can't break it. Um, uh, a comment uh, regarding uh, Dr. Bray's uh, uh, mention of Michael Pollan and his book, The Omnivore's Dilemma. Everybody, if they haven't read it, read it. It speaks to everything we're talking about here. And my question is, Surprisingly, nobody mentioned the thrifty hypothesis. I, I can't uh, remember if Dr. Speakman was for or against it. But, but, but what about these uh, populations that, that uh, you know, were uh, at one point lean and are now fat? Is this all appetite? Or are there uh, fat-storing genes that, that are uh, upregulated in these individuals under some genetic program? And that's the issue. Can I say something? Of it? So uh, I kind of looked at the thrifty gene idea in some detail, and uh, as far as I can see, it, it doesn't really stand up to any sort of rigorous analysis. So the idea that historically we deposited fat in order to get through periods of famine, and the fat people survived the famines, and the thin people died, was really Virtually no evidence to support that idea whatsoever. What about the shipwreck thing, where the people in the some on some uh, uh, whaler, the where are we getting all the feedback from? You know, that they, they were shipwrecked, and there were a dozen of them or so, and the first to die were the leanest, and the ones that survived. Uh, okay. So, so I mean, there's lots of data like that. If if you look at, for example, political hunger strikers then political hunger strikers die before fat political hunger strikers. So you're only in, ever in that situation of deciding whether you want to go on hunger strike. No, I don't have to be fat. I'm not going to do it. Choose, choose to go later in your, in your thinner. But, but the point is you, you can engineer a situation where that's the case, where it will definitely be those people that die. In, in reality, though, in a real famine, uh, the numbers of people that die are actually relatively small. They aren't the fat people, they tend to be the young people. There's lots and lots of difficulties with that whole idea that it's the fat people yeah, that survive. Yeah, I don't have any problem with that. I'm just, I'm just asking uh, the second part of the question is, what are the genes then that are underlying the fact that Pimas and other South Pacific Islanders, etc., are now massively obese? Uh, and, and never used to be. Are there are there genes that underlie that, or is it simply behavior? I mean, is it all appetite? Uh, there's a number of questions in there. I, I, I think that chasing down genes for ethnic specific or, 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 or small group specific traits versus other people is exceptionally difficult because obviously you know, a person from Tonga differs from a person from Japan in a huge number of ways. They look different. These are the genes that are, so to try to track down what are the genes that make them tend to be fatter uh, is, is exceptionally difficult. Uh, but but, but you can look at the obvious candidates, right? You can look at the MC4 receptor. Uh, so and so at the moment, at the moment, for, as far as I know, and as far as we've been studied, in groups like the PEMAs and others, the prevalence of those sorts of loss of function mutations in PEMAs, like in MC4, is just the same as it is in the general population. The, of, of the known genes, there's no, there's no particular collusion or group, grouping of those known genes that can be attributed, to which you can attribute the, the excessive adiposity of particular uh, isolates. I mean, my, my guess is, I, I kind of agree with John, although it's possible, I think, that you might have this, you might have had an instance, at least, of the, of the surviving, starving you know, ship, ship goers uh, populating an island. I mean, they, the population isolate is a possibility, but, but 
by and large, if, you, if you've got isolated populations that are largely obese, there could have been by random chance that the, the two or three people that populated that island happened to be destined to be fat and, and not necessarily selected for that reason, but just because there have got to be some people who are on the top end of the, on the, top end of the curve. Steve, let me ask you to, to uh, tell us what your perspective is about these genome-wide association studies. You, you showed us that picture that's coming out by Luce, I know there's a giant study. Um, and FTO is about, as, as I heard the papers at uh, Obesity Society, about 50% of those eight genes is in the FTO, which means the other seven are, are the remaining 50% of that small group. And the total group's uh, contribution to the variance of weight in that population is less than 1%. So it's a tiny amount. And you showed us that nice related figure with the numbers, but, but still it's small. So what, and the guess that I guess someone put forward in the question in, in Phoenix was it would take 500 genes to get your variance up to 90% or more. So what is this going to do for us? Uh, yeah, and we're going to take enormous populations to pick out those other sides because there, there were 30,000 for the first trial and another 30,000 to back it up. So we've got, we have 100,000 and 100,000 more to back it up. What's this going to do for us? So, so doing for us, I suppose, there's two questions. One is, one is what we know purely as academics and we'd like to know what the genetic architecture of obesity is because we're curious. And secondly, what it do, can do for us in terms of therapeutics. Yeah. Uh, I guess in terms of therapeutics, if you can be absolutely clear that a particular molecule is, is relevant to the regulation of human adiposity, then that validates it as a therapeutic target <clears throat> considerably and provides great confidence that targeting that would be a, might be a useful thing to do. So, so that, that's true whether it's a single human being with a total loss of function mutation or 10,000 human beings with, with, a, with a SNP that, that changes its expression 5%. So, so you, you can learn from genetics as a guide, if you like, to physiology and pharmacology. And then you move to say, well, what use is genetics in terms of prediction and the sorts of things right. that a clinical geneticist does in a clinical genetics clinic and sees families and things? Well, the answer to that at the moment, but this is the square root of bugger all, uh, I, I mean, at, at, the, at the moment, <laughs> and, uh, because, you know, these, as you rightly say, this, this gives you about, you know, a 1% explanation of the variance right, in, 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 the, in, in the population. And it's unlikely that even larger studies will get us common SNP variants that give a much bigger. You know, so, so what I said in my, my talk is I, I think that we're likely to take another bite out of the cherry with common copy number variation, which might, which might explain, uh, you know, in some phenotypes it explains quite a lot. But my guess is that the genetics of obesity is very complicated, and that, and that it, and it's large, it's very different in different groups. And, and we might find that certain genetic isolates that, that, that there are, are SNPs that have a big effect and have a big explanatory power. But in an outbred population, at like the United States or Western Europe or wherever, there's going to be a, there's going to be a lot of genetic heterogeneity, heterogeneity. and then you, you can you can then ask when people write their grants to try and find those genes how how much use is that going to be. And you know, those of us who try that will find it tougher as time goes on. Um, but no doubt we'll find a way of explaining to you. No, no personalized medicine for you? <laughs> yes. 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 Could I just add something to that? One, one additional feature of that architecture of the genetics is basically that the thrifty gene idea can't be correct. If it was correct, there would be a few genes of very large effect that influence thrift. Like there is for skin color, for example. Yeah. Yeah. So um, most of these studies seem to be um, global and countrywide, and uh, a lot of the calculations that we heard were, well, the United States uh, in general, uh, uh, food intake hasn't gone up and, and activity maybe has gone up and we're still getting fatter, but uh, there's enormous uh, personal and, and statewide and community specific and, and um, uh, occupation specific uh, variation in this, and to what extent, uh, I didn't hear any of that research discussed if it exists. <laughs> I guess I didn't hear <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, you know, in, in, um, in the Midwest, there seem to be a lot better people than there are in Boston. And I don't, that's, that's not just a personal observation, I believe. That's sure. 
Mm -hmm. I suppose I mentioned that in the question about socioeconomic class versus animosity. And in the U.S., it tends to be poorer states that that have that have uh, uh, higher rates of uh, of obesity, and that again speaks to. Yeah. So I don't doubt that class is a contributor, but uh, people who live in cities walk more than people who uh, used to be the sorts of people who used a lot more calories when they were working on the farm manually, but now that everything's automated, they walk a whole lot less. So it would seem to me that there would be a lot of information to be had by studying these variabilities across these small I guess that's where I saw the interaction. Because if you impose a living in a city on a Midwest population, take away their cars, they're likely to regulate at a slightly lower level. They're slightly likely to eat slightly less because they might be more sensitive to satiety signals. That's that's where I conceive the interaction coming in. I think that people who live in cities fidget more because they're stressed out. <laughs> 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 Did we get that? Uh, Carolyn's hypothesis is that people <laughs> fidget. I find country, uh, the country uh, really nervous. <laughs> nervous. <laughs> <laughs> All those um, yeah. yeah, another intriguing notion I had about this obesity epidemic was that um, in addition to food regulation and exercise, I'm starting to see like in a study, for example, of gastric bypass in lab there, that some people who lose the weight, they are more likely to unmask depression and suicide. So it doesn't seem to be just losing weight. There's also some emotional component to, to it, probably to address that sort of like on a population level. Uh, tough. <laughs> That's kind of a question about human unhappiness and happiness. And, uh, you know, the great, I, would, I would turn that question over to the great philosophers and novelists rather than a bunch of, uh, of scientists. <laughs> I think mean, read more Proust. There was, there, was, there was an era in the field when uh, uh, an effort was focused on finding the obesity personality and whether there were emotional features that contributed significantly to its development. Uh, and a paper by Mendel Solman Stunker looked at this um, by collecting lots of people and, and, and looking at patterns that were there and had a control group, which is always the issue. Sometimes don't get good control groups. But when they got a good control group and, uh, of hospital-based people where, where all these obese people were being seen, they concluded that there were clearly interesting behavioral deviations in their obese people, but that they were no more common than they were in other people in the guest GI clinic or the renal clinics. And they concluded that there were, was no behavioral pattern that was predictive of being fat, but there were behaviors that were a consequence of becoming obese that could be removed. Now, the depression issue is an interesting one. Uh, <clears throat> the major papers that argue that there's a depression associated with obesity are papers from the United States. Papers from Europe, from the rest of the world, don't seem to find this. And, and what that means about our healthcare system, which we were hearing, hearing about at noontime, um, or other aspects, I don't fully understand. But there seems to be a very big difference between the uh, obesity depression relationship in this country and the depression obesity relationship in all of the other Western countries. English, German, French, Italian, Spanish, and other speakers. So I, and I don't know what that difference means, nor did the person who wrote this analysis. But there does seem to be a big and important difference. So I, I think it's, a, it's an interesting area to pursue where the current issues are pretty well not defined. It's hard to see. Well, First of all, I like the idea that maybe my weight gain is due to the fact I'm fidgeting less. Close to that? Okay. Um, I have, I'm still bothered by a quantitative question, because it seems to me that proving that uh, obesity rise, that, that, um, that exercise or, uh, is not a factor, proving a negative, I think, is, is, is very tough. Uh, and I mean, if you if you don't find a significant rise in or significant decrease in exercise, uh, that doesn't 
necessarily mean the same thing as saying we haven't found what what would you need a one percent drop okay, I mean could you measure a one percent drop because I just you know when I see and, and then this also relates uh, to I don't know how many of your the studies were done on you know children or youth and we talked about the matter that you know this may follow us on until later years but I know you know even even myself as a as a as a kid uh, you know we had phys ed every day okay and uh, you know and and we ran around a lot and I you know I just find it hard to believe that that is not a factor so can you tell me are are your data strong enough to state that there isn't a 1% change or something? If a 1% change is what would be necessary to get the rise. Okay, let, let, let me address two, two issues then in that question. One is the inclusion of different age groups in the data. So the, the data is all normalized for age, but there aren't any uh, sub adults in there, so they're all aged between 18 and 60. So it's unlikely there are big age effects anyway in the sample, but we took age out as a factor anyway. So the real question that I think you're asking is that if the model that Dr. Bray presented is correct, that if it only needs a 10 calorie a day difference in order to produce this enormous weight change, then is it really possible in our data to detect that sort of difference over time? And the answer is no, it isn't strong enough to do that. <coughs> However, the model that he presented has a, an interesting quirk in it and something that you really need to understand to, to really know what he's saying. So what, what he says in that model is that if your expenditure is say 10 or some people say 60 or 100 calories more. I like 100 better. Let's take 100 then if he says 100 is better. If you eat 100 calories more, you will not get obese. You have to progressively increase your intake to always be 100 more than what you're expending. So if you eat 100 calories more, 100 calories more is a big apple. If you eat a big apple every day, that will not make you obese. Because what happens is your growth, it will make you grow slightly initially, but as you grow, your expenditure will increase and that will eventually be 100 calories of extra expenditure that balances the apple that you're eating every day. So at that point, once your expenditures increase, you have to eat another apple in order to sustain that weight gain. So when he says 100 calories a day above expenditure, you have to take account in the model that your expenditure is always increasing as you get bigger and bigger. So in fact, what it means is that in order to put on 20 kilos of body weight, your actual intake, your starting intake, has to be enormous. It has to be about 1,000. 2,000 calories more in order to continuously rise your energy expenditure. And that's related to the fact that, remember that plot I showed you initially of the double level water expenditure against body weight? That relationship governs how much extra food you need in order to put on weight to a certain point. So if you look at that graph, that tells you how much extra energy you need to eat. And that's much, much more than 100 calories. Well, if, if I can respond, okay, I know that I weigh a lot more than I did in college. And I eat a lot less, okay? So there's got to be something, <coughs> well, something's not making sense there. You're my I typical mean, patient. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. you probably eat less because you're exercising less. Good what? Body. You probably eat less because you're exercising less. Yeah. Yeah. I remember, I remember that there were some quite interesting uh, data in science that came to the fact that our mitochondria were becoming very dysfunctional and would just die in bigger numbers once you hit the 40s. And so that 
you didn't have all your future cycles, and so your energy expenditure was not the same, and you just put on weight, even if you were, that was the theory, you put on weight because the, the system is different. So if, if you look at energy expenditure against age, there's no evidence for a big decline at age 40. There's a progressive decline from age 18 down into your 70s, but there's no real kick in around about your 40s. Let me enter into this for just a second. When I was used to practice at Tufts down the street here, I had to earn some money seeing patients. And I, in order to have time for the laboratory, I, I could only see people who weighed more than 300 pounds. So that was the, that was the bottom line. If you didn't weigh more than 300, you couldn't get in the office. Too bad I didn't start collecting. These. Steve, I might have had a real population for you then. Um, well, hey, if they didn't look that big, we weighed them and sent them out. What, there, this group of people um, were all quite young, um, and they had a characteristic which f fascinated me. And I, in an early monograph I wrote, I called it progressive obesity, because they were gaining on, on average about 10 pounds per year, per year, per year, per year, per year. So if you knew what they weighed at age 18, 180 pounds, they weighed 300 pounds at 30, and they weighed 400 pounds at 40. This, to me, is an example of something that can only be progressive increase in food intake, never that activity, although it goes up as you get heavier, this food intake must always just keep rising beyond that. So I, I think this food intake issue, the positive energy balance, occurs in a group of people who are always eating more no matter how their weight is tracking. There's a much, much larger group who will do what you did. You said you get some and you come up and you reach a new higher level and you plateau off because Whatever that intake is, uh, you reach a point at which the activity and the energy reach a balance. That's a larger group, I think, than this progressive. Well, I, think I, I, I beg to differ on that. I mean, you know, right. the last few years. Let, let me let other people have their questions. Come to Caroline. You will not help, I guarantee you. Hi, thank you. It's a great presentation. Hello. It's a great presentation. And um, it's clear that this issue can be addressed on many fronts. And the one that interests me in particular is the cultural one. Um, because just in my lifetime, I think the changes have been so striking in food intake and in the percentage of overweight people. And um, I've been hoping that there would be a public awareness campaign along the lines of the anti-smoking campaign that I think was very effective in reducing smoking rates and really changing public attitudes towards smoking. And, and so, you know, I feel like in this culture, overeating and eating unhealthy foods has really become the norm. And so I think that, you know, as part of, you know, it's not as part of a, a, a fluoride solution, you know, that there, that, that aspect, I think, um, could make a real difference. It's your advice. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, if I could just comment, I mean, I, mean, I absolutely agree that, that uh, you know, I, I, at the end of my talk, I, I, I talked about the potential approaches, the governmental approaches to prevention through information, education, etc. But a key difference between obesity and, and smoking is that smoking is a voluntary inhalation of a substance that's not necessary for life, whereas eating is an absolute prerequisite for existence. And therefore, the, the ease with which you can in, in have legislation uh, and, and encourage governmental encouragements to discourage smoking, which is an unnecessary activity, and one potentially toxic, although I think it's probably exaggerated for effect, but it's very effective, the, the effect of passive smoking, you can actually bring in legislation to coerce people not to do it. I think that model will be greatly more difficult to bring in to the issue of, of what people are controlling, what people ingest. I think, I think you can do, I think you, you will be able to do all sorts of things in terms of information, advertising, etc. But, you know, it, 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 I, I can't conceive an American electorate encouraging their, 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 government, in their government to, you know, for instance, regulate portion size. No, uh, no, I don't mean anything like that. I think that societal attitudes are very important. And I think when, when overeating has become just very socially acceptable and big portions are the norm, you know, that, that just like, you know, the anti-smoking campaign, I think, made smoking, you know, the perception of it made it less attractive. I think the same thing <coughs> can happen with overeating and with the kind of foods that we eat. 
Well, you go to McDonald's. I do from time to time. I do. I do what I do, and I'm not fat at going to McDonald's. It, it's a matter of quantity you eat. They're very tasty. That stuff's darn good food. And, and, um, I, and sorry, folks. I hope those of you who don't like this approach, so they really are. They're very tasty, and and and, and the government has. Uh, uh, tilted the field against fat folk um, by subsidizing all of the things that make it possible to provide these very tasty, very <coughs> cheap foods. So what you need to do is to get us as taxpayers not to have to fund all these farmers to feed into the system which is making us fat. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's where the problem is. And, and I, my view is that cognitive strategies are very difficult. People don't like to deprive themselves or think they are. And so you've got to do it in a very subtle way. If you took away the subsidies, the prices of McDonald's hamburgers, if they were $5 instead of $1, that would make a big impact. Mm -hmm. But as long as you and I want to pay our taxes to subsidize our farmers, to make high fat, high sugar foods dirt cheap, we've got a problem. So, so get the legislature to change what we do. <laughs> we need a smart legislature like the British have. <laughs> sure. the Scots have. I, I, I can comment on that. I, I just sat on uh, the Scottish Parliament's uh, cross-party working group on obesity, and I disagree completely. Our government isn't smart at all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, okay. that's okay. No government's very smart. I think we all agree that our governments could use some help. Uh, I want to ask a, a, a different kind of question, and that is one of the big issues that we've heard about over the years is the great difficulty in getting reliable data on food intake and activity and, and actually the nature of the food that's taken in. To get really reliable on the data in these areas has been extraordinarily difficult. And I wonder if anyone can think of ways in which we might collaborate, for example, with, with bioengineering or other disciplines. We're all sort of scientists and physicians here. I mean, maybe we're not the, the right only group to be tackling this problem. So, comments? Yeah, there, there were a couple of papers presented um, at the uh, Obesity Science Society using digital photography to take pictures of what people eat. And I think that uh, gives you the potential for analyzing real measures as opposed to what people report. You know, when you ask them what they did, they'll tell you what they want you to know. And that's why we picked dietitians to try to give us accurate reports, because we knew they were professionals, that they knew we were watching them, they'd probably do better. And they did really as well sure. as I think anybody does. But for most people, it's, it's a pretty tough job, so you've got to get some way to get an independent record in digital photography, I think it, it, it was very, I was very intrigued by this possibility. But you can't tell how long the chicken was in the fryer and how greasy it is. It could have varied, varied by hundreds of calories. Well, yeah, but, you, but you're better off than having the report it treated. Which affects the I mean, at, least, at least you can get the you can get the volume of what you've got. Otherwise, you're saying, you know, I had a, I had one portion. Well, what's that portion? Right. So as, as I understand it, uh, the, the technique that they tried to develop there was using mobile phones, cell phones, to take a picture of the food. And, that, and what they actually found was that doing that, that actual process, reduced your caloric mm -hmm. intake. Always goes when you monitor. That's cool. <laughs> it's a little Good. All the better. We should give people phones <laughs> to monitor their intake. Exactly. Well, one of the, the critical populations in this, in, in this obesity problem is the children. And I don't think children have such a big issue about reporting and what you think and what they think that you think they should be having. I'm sure they probably don't really have any idea what they've eaten. And I think most of us don't pay a great deal of attention to the precise quantities. And in fact, it takes a trained dietitian to make a reasonable estimate of what is being consumed unless an individual is weighing everything that goes in. So. Uh, so that's intrinsically a flawed way of, of reporting information. And so, so I think that in the case of children, monitoring by visual means, for example, might be interesting. I mean, certainly when it comes to our experience with test meals uh, in children with genetic forms of obesity, they're totally unabashed about eating. Uh, <laughs> under observation, whereas adults will very much want to manipulate what the result is. 
is. So I think you're more likely to get an unbiased assessment of intake in, in children. I've long had a dream about an implantable tooth camera that you yeah. could put in the <laughs> that, that, exactly. yeah, that right. would be that people would just forget about it right. and you could automatically uh, <laughs> do a and maybe combined with bioassays, biosensors for fat and that <laughs> I, I think that you know the, the trip to the moon that you one of you talked about probably required a great deal more technology than that tooth camera. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, I, I'm yeah. thinking, you know, shouldn't we talk to some other people? But we're not really solving this problem too well, I don't think. No, You've got to stand up and use the microphone. Harry, you come up yes, next. Barry Shannon, that was uh, heading the Harvard Genome Institute. Uh, he's now, he, he went to doing some new stuff and he developed a device which is measuring, um, which is coordinating uh, when, when you're about to eat. This device kicks in and it is measuring um, different physiological measures, including uh, um, blood pressure heart rate, etc., and, and some other uh, measures uh, that you don't have to, to uh, do it, does it automatically. And um, it basically tells you you're eating now, tell me what you're eating, and then you have to just press something, and uh, basically ask you what's the weight of it. And the combination of the two was able to uh, predict uh, or to match within the 5% of the intake of calories. Uh, including the different uh, sources of uh, food. But I wanted also to comment something about the hedonic uh, issue. And this is as a person that came from, from Israel, where food is really good, and was visiting uh, for about three months in England. Um, I, I, you would expect that I would lose half, half of my weight. I, in fact, my father told me this was, uh, I was 18 years old. He told me, you know, when you go to England, if you, if you don't have to go there, if you want to taste the food, I'll just give you a candle and you can chew it. <laughs> so, so, it was not that bad. But I, I would expect to lose some weight, but instead, I was gaining the highest, the fastest weight gain that I've ever had in my life. And when I came back to Israel, I lost all of it within the same amount of time that I gained it. So, so it tells, this tells me, and uh, the, Maybe the, the taste and the smell is not all about it. And also, um, now I have a lab here in the US and I see the, all the Israeli postdocs and students that are coming to my lab and they're all gaining weight and complaining about the food. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there is more. The population is more than N equals one. So there is something about it. So, so there are uh, variations in taste receptors that will um, uh, affect bitter preference. Bitter, the ability to detect bitter that affect your preference for fat that are associated with alterations in BMI. So, so it's it's clearly a biological basis, potential biological basis for that. I mean, if things taste terrible, keep eating them and hope that they'll. <laughs> I, I, I always wanted the person who discovered this polymorphism to go to McDonald's and see whether there's a greater prevalence of the polymorphism in the people who choose to eat at McDonald's. Yeah, so just a, I just have one comment about children and obesity, and, the, and, and actually it's an analogy that you can draw by looking at children with seizure disorders that are put on ketogenic diets. So un, up until adolescence, you know, about age 12 or so, children really have you know, get they eat what's in the in their houses, and they don't really have money that they can go spend on like you know bars at school unless their parents are giving them money. And in fact, the really sad thing is that the parents buy into marketing and they buy things like yo baby yogurt, which is all you know sugar, and so they can turn their kids on to you know sweetened yogurt. If you look at the kids with seizure disorders, um, their parents have total control over the food, and if they and, and so these are kids who, who have intractable seizures, and they're put on ketogenic diets in order to suppress the seizures. And about 30% of these kids actually have full seizure suppression when they're put on the ketogenic diet, and if they have a cookie, okay, they get a seizure. And the parents become extremely vested in being sure that they are eating the ketogenic diet. And a ketogenic diet, if you're a kid, it's on one of these diets. If you have blueberries and cream, you're having a cup of cream and ten blueberries in there. I mean, that's how that's how like the diets were originally defined. Although they have been loosened up to a certain degree, um, it turns out as long as they're ketotic, they're okay, and you can maintain ketosis on an Atkins style kind of induction diet. 
And um, those kids are lean, and they don't gain weight, and mm -hmm. the parents are monitoring their diet at all times. So I think when you see a fat kid, you need to look to see what the parents are letting them eat. And it's probably ad lib all the time, bad stuff that's in the house that the parents eat. So that's where it's coming from. And to add to that, I would say that uh, we basic scientists know that you can't store fat without carbohydrate. So it kind of takes both. Uh, the concept that fat is responsible is very difficult to swallow. No, but if you don't have fat, you can't right. get fat. Exactly yeah. right. I, I agree with both okay, of those. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. I've never seen you. Better have carbohydrates. <laughs> if you have 20% fat diets in animals, it's almost impossible to get from fat. You, you have to have a higher fat intake. But, but these kids are eating, the, the actual diet is 20% protein, between about 10% carb, and 70% fat, and they don't gain weight. They're actually lean. Right. You can get fat on any diet. Yeah, like, no, you have you, to look you do know that. People lose weight on the Atkins diet. Yeah, no, no, it's, it, it, not it, it's, it's not really. I mean, if they stop, if they go off the diet and go on a regular diet, and they start, they they will actually gain back weight. But I think their their carb is so restricted that they actually can't gain weight on this diet, and everything that they're eating is actually controlled by their parents. So. There, you know, and my guess is that the that if you open, if they open the fridge, there's no there's no like you know candy in there. So. Can, I, can I just make a comment on the original question about methods for measuring food intake? I think whatever method we use to try and measure what's going in is always going to be subject to these psychological problems that the person changes what they're doing or they forget how much food. If, if we try and depend on of self-report and, and we've sort of become in, increasingly thoughtful about perhaps maybe unsavory as it is measuring what comes out might be a better way of quantifying what food intake is and i, and I think there's, there's a lot to gain from that total urine collections are not really that difficult but they have dissociated completely from the feeding event and you can infer an awful lot from total urine. Interesting. Do we have other questions? I, 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 maybe I can ask one more and then we can finish off our wine and cheese. So uh, I, I think I've learned today that in con uh, the, the control of appetite is the main characteristic that uh, is related to obesity, or food intake is the main characteristic. And I think Steve has sort of implied that he thinks the central rather than, than the peripheral signals are, are the key players. And my question is, since both appetite and energy expenditure have a central regulator controller, which I don't think anyone would disagree with, how could you identify a peripheral signal different from a central signal? Okay, so so I think you're right. We had this discussion yesterday about about you know, defining one's terms. So I, I agree with, with John that it's very important to try and separate out whether things that predispose to adipocyte gain come from primarily food intake or primarily uh, energy expenditure. And it's pretty clear that in terms of food intake, uh, the brain has to be involved somehow because the brain is what, is what you know, makes you ingest, ingest things. But of course the control over that uh, is is, is governed by a hierarchy of responses, and we know the adipocyte is key. We know the adipocyte is key to, to, to some of that. We know that you know, the, le the leptin is, is a key controller. We know that uh, that the gut and gut hormones and gut. Uh, so 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 the brain doesn't act in isolation. It it, it, it acts as a, a, a as a sensor receptive organ for a whole series of, of, of signals. So uh, I, I wouldn't like to restrict my view of the central control of food intake to just what's above the neck. It, it, it's interpreting a set of signals that, come, that comes from the periphery. Likewise, I think that many of those central controls of food intake are intimately co concerned with energy expenditure. It's pretty clear that if you disrupt melanocortin-4 receptor signaling in the brain, not only do you increase the drive to food intake, but you also have subtle but definite effects on, uh, on, on, on energy expenditure. Uh, pretty likely, certainly in animals and probably in humans, they're subtle, but they're there. And of course, as we've heard, just subtle effects are probably enough to, to, to put you in another direction. So I think a, a very simplistic separation of food intake, of, let's say the hypothalamus controlling food intake and not sympathetic outflow would be silly because it, it clearly has got an involvement in both of those, let's say, things. And some of the molecules might be, have 
a, a completely symmetrical role in both in both processes. But there's also there's no shortage of transgenic models where you alter only the expression of peripheral gene and change energy expenditure, exercise, and food intake control. So, you know, Pepsi K muscle of expressor has one funky phenotype. They're still going to affect. Them, right? Yeah. Oh, ultimate, ultimate. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. But the the variation is in a in peripheral, peripheral system. Yes. Final word, George. Well, I was going to ask my two. Uh, adipocentric folks here on my left. Uh, <laughs> one very much <laughs> uh, about adiponectin, which didn't get mentioned. Oh, By I, either I one of you. I I I well, <laughs> Phil, Phil Scherer presented some data which I thought was fascinating where he overexpresses yes. the uh, adiponectin gene and gets enormously fat, insulin sensitive animals. How do you put that into this, your frameworks of, of things? You two, go, go, tell me. Explain that one to me. So, so Phil Schur made an adiponectin overexpression in mouse, mm -hmm. and the mouse had very sensitive, not not inflamed adipose tissue, great adipose tissue, stored fat. Mouse was extremely healthy. It can overcome an obio. And it was very very fat. I mean, huge. It was extremely fat. Huge. It weighed 140 grams, if you know, for mouse. Um, so yeah. I would say that there is no shortage of morbidly obese people with extremely insulin sensitive. Fat, which could in part be due to variations in a dip in actin or God knows what else. Okay. So when I, because I have my hands on a lot of yep. severely obese fat, yep. and um, at least half of it is really, really insulin sensitive. So, 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 I mean, it is a molecule that we need to think about. Cause, uh, I mean, surprisingly, nobody no, they I, mentioned adiponectin. Uh, so I actually cut my, my talk short. It would have been in there. It would have been in there. <laughs> Seeing as, seeing as we're in a provocative and speculative mode, and I've talked to Phil Shearer about this, and I've seen him present data about adiponectin in adipocytes, and the second piece of observation that he's made, which is, I think, equally important to the one that you've just mentioned, is that when you transgenically overexpress adiponectin in liver, achieving similar peripheral concentrations, you get no such protection against the insulin resistance. So it is uniquely <clears throat> the overexpression in adipose tissue which protects it. So it has to be in adipose tissue. And the other piece of information is that adiponectin, uh, the, the regulation of whether it's secreted or retained intracellularly is highly post-translational. Uh, and and, and in, in essentially in, in, in fasting, in states of low energy ex expenditure, adiponectin secretion is high from adipose tissues. In, in situations of high positive energy balance, adiponectin secretion is low. Now the wacky hypothesis, the wacky bit, is that maybe adiponectin doesn't have receptors at all. Maybe these receptors have nothing to do, because it circulates in vast amounts. Maybe it's a carrier protein. And maybe what it's doing is carrying lipophilic ligands to peripheral tissues. So when it goes up, it carries, let's say, a PPAR alpha or PPAR delta ligand to your liver and your muscle and induces fatty acid oxidation peripherally. And when you're in positive energy balance, it decides to stay in the adipocyte and it carries similar lipophilic molecules to the nucleus and triggers the PPAR gamma response. Now that's all completely speculative because that's what you asked us to do here today. But it's the, it's, I think it's a very cool idea. It's mainly Philip, it's Phillips. He hasn't explicitly stated it like that, but his data, his data would suggest that adiponectin may be acting in that sort of way as a way of redirecting nutrients either towards adipose tissue in, in situations of positive energy balance or towards burning other, other sources of calories in, in situations of, of, of negative energy balance. So that's, that's what it's there for, rather than being a hormone. It's too present in vast quantities in the plasma. It doesn't look like a hormone. Steve, you have two minutes to get your taxi. <laughs> Sorry to say this. I want my glass of wine. Grab your glass of wine. Grab your glass of wine, man. Yeah. 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 We, we don't want to deprive you of wine. Go. I, I really, I wanted to give everyone a last word, but I don't want to deprive you of your wine. So yeah. perhaps we can thank all of our speakers. It's been a wonderful day.